That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Uh, I'm Timony West. I'm the director of XR Research at Unity Labs. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a lot about hardware and software through the ages and how they have affected each other and how they might affect the future as well. So my goal today is to have you walk away with just one simple point. Inputs are how users talk to computers. So if you limit inputs, you limit what the user can say. And if you design inputs well, you can expand what humans not only can do with computers, but what they think that they can do with computers. But it's not just about inputs. It's about how you can make inputs good. So for inputs to work, they require basically three things. You have to have some kind of feedback loop that is either physical, auditory, or visual. This is pretty classic. Unless you want to go like with smell or taste, which I don't recommend, this is what you've got to work with. And the same is true of affordances on the other end. So for users to know what they can do, you, again, have to have physical feedback, visual feedback, or auditory feedback. That's it. These are your options. OK, so affordances always have to be taught. And when it comes to intuitive design, people often say that this is a thing that really exists. That's the feeling in the air right now that you want to make things intuitive. But there is no such thing as intuition. If you have something that feels intuitive, someone else has already taught the user how to use it. All right. There's actually a $10 word for this. It's called apperception. I just learned about it myself. How a person makes sense of the world by fitting it into things that they already know. So good design should fit into these systems. And usually when we talk about good design or things that feel really good, that's because they fit into the way people already think about the world. So as I said, um, you have to decide between these three options. Usually the best design stuff has all three to a certain degree. It's a ratio, right? If you have more of one and you have less of one. Uh, for example, audio feedback you can pretty rarely depend on because users often mute their devices or they have their headphones in. So that one means you might need more physical feedback or a heck of a lot more of visual feedback. Um, and obviously, there's some accessibility issues as well. But if you push up the visual feedback, you can scale back on the physical feedback, and you'll still have generally a total good. There's also a relationship between physical feedback specifically and the other two. And this one is important. When you start to pe teach people how to use things, you usually have to teach them with words or with visuals, with icons or something. You have to be a little bit more handholdy. And as people get better at whatever it is they're trying to do, they start to store more, more of it in muscle memory, and then it can go more into physical feedback. So you kind of need to front load the first two early on in the life cycle of anything, be it a product, a computer, a new device, learning an instrument, for example. And then later on, it can be moved more into the user's muscle memory. OK. So these are the rules. If you want to have any sort of good design on literally anything that humans interact with, you need these three things in some form, and, and they have a ratio between them. OK, so now let's start with the fun stuff, the historical stuff. We're going to start in 1936 with the Seaberg Rayolite. The Seaberg Rayolite is about 100% as cool as you think it might be. It looked like this, and it was the original version of Duck Hunt. It was made by the Seabird Company, which also made jukeboxes. That is what the gun looked like. <laughs> so was this the first video game? No, I don't think so. It didn't really have any of the video components that we know today. But it was one of the first real games that had an electric component. And this gets more important later on. There weren't really any video games until the 1950s. Uh, the most important one was Space Wars, and we'll talk about that one in a little bit. So Seabird Rail Light, 1936. Fast forward 10 years, and we have the rollerball, the, not quite the mouse. OK. So Ralph Benjamin um, is a British guy who worked uh, during World War II in the Navy. And back when he looked like this, he invented something that looked like this. So this is, he, he called it the rollerball. And it was made for the uh, British uh, radar system uh, for air, to, to detect airborne uh, missile defense stuff. There is no actual original uh, version of the rollerball. It doesn't exist because it was held under lock and key. It was never patented for years, and it was considered classified until the 50s after the war. So this is a copy that the uh, Canadian government made for their own radar system. So if you kind of like look carefully, you think, OK, maybe this kind of looks like the inside, upside down part of a rollerball mouse. Like, you get it. The guts are there. You know, like, just turn around, put a plastic case on it. You got yourself a mouse, right? 
Um, the other thing, too, though, is if you thought that looked like a bowling ball, it's because it was a bowling ball. <laughs> so it changes the scale quite a bit. Um, one thing I really love about this is this was 1946, and they already had a really good sense of moving something around on a screen like this and moving something else to manipulate it. And I feel like that's just a really cool ability that humans have, and this really showcases that. OK, so is this the earliest computer-specific input? I think, actually, yes, this might be. Um, there are a lot of buttons and toggles and keyboards that were existed at the time, too. But this one was very specifically designed to interact with something on a screen. So here's some examples of other computers. This one's actually a little bit earlier. Uh, old punch card machines from back in the day. And uh, this was over at, I think, uh, Lincoln Lab, and you can see keyboards were always sort of ubiquitous. Tons of toggles, tons of buttons, always ubiquitous. Um, joysticks actually were pretty common from the beginning. They took them out of airplanes and used them for the space program really early on, and they made their way into computers. Oh, there's more punch cards. But the joysticks ended up looking something like this, and this will see familiar a little bit later on. But there was also something that looked like this. In classic military fashion, these men are using guns. <laughs> but they are using them on a screen. Now, I know this looks like a radar screen, but it's not actually. It is a CRT. And this works exactly the way the Seaberg rail light worked. They have things that can detect light. It goes into a little light detecting tube and gives you feedback. So this is from the 50s. This was from the SAGE semi-automatic ground environment. Uh, again, post-World War II. Dawn of the Cold War, they were using things like this. Now, I have a question, which is, why don't you ever see this in movies? Because this looks really cool, like, right? OK. Um, yeah, so in the military, they use guns. But at the same time, there was a lot of academic partnerships between the military and so on. I've mentioned uh, Lincoln Lab before, but they come up again. Lincoln Lab uh, made something that looked like this, a pen instead. And I want to pause on this one for a minute, because this is a pretty futuristic-looking interface for 1962. Um, this is someone drawing an electrical illustration on a CRT. Uh, and this is still yeah, from Lincoln Lab. And I'm going to actually play a video uh, for you. This very stern-looking man is Dr. Stephen Coons. He was a, professional, a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT and a co-director of the Computer-Aided computer Design Project. This is from 1964. The reason I want to talk about this, or have you listen to this, is because he talks about input and interacting with, with computers in a way that I had never heard before and I think is very unusual. But I think it is worthwhile to think about, especially when it comes to spatial computing. So here he goes. John, we're going to show you. Can you turn it up? A man actually talking to a computer in a way far different than it's ever been possible to do before. Surely not with his voice. No, he's going to be talking graphically. He's going to be drawing. And the computer is going to understand his drawings. And the man will be using a language, a graphical language, that we call Sketchpad, that started with Ivan Sutherland some years ago when he was busy working on his doctoral degree. And you will see a designer, effectively, solving a problem step by step and he will not at the outset know precisely what his problem is nor will he know exactly how to solve it but little by little he will begin to investigate ideas and the computer and he will be in cooperation in the fullest cooperation in this work well now how does this differ from the way the computer has been used in the past to solve problems well the conventional way the, the old way of solving problems with a computer has been to understand the problem very, very well indeed, and moreover, to know at the very outset just exactly what steps are necessary to solve the problem. And so the computer has been, in a sense, nothing but a very elaborate calculating machine. But now we're making the computer be more like a, almost like a human assistant. And the computer will, will seem to have some intelligence. It doesn't really, only the intelligence that we put in it. But it will seem to have intelligence. So I think this is fascinating because what you're about to see next, what he was describing, is just this. It's just someone drawing on a screen, which is something that we can do every day all the time now. 
But this was a real shift in thinking about what computers were supposed to do. At the beginning, they just were supposed to do what you told them. This was an attempt to get a computer to work alongside you. And I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about how we should be designing inputs across the board and hardware in the future. Things that work with you help solve the problem together. So this is Ivan Sutherland and that sketch pad. That's one of the first uh, interfaces for drawing on the screen that I was ever made. And I know the light pen looks like it might be a little tricky, little gorilla arm, a little hard to hold over time. But actually, at the same time, Rand Corporation was also making a desktop version. So it wasn't about ex usability. They were already working on this. I mean, this cost $18,000, so it wasn't ever going like, to really take off. But you know, they were, they were thinking about how best people could use it on the regular. So. If Ivan Sutherland, the name, sounded familiar, that is because that is also the dude who invented the, what was it called, Sword of Damocles, the first VR headset. So whoever this guy, this guy was amazing, uh, Ivan Sutherland. Um, as so far as I know, it didn't have any cu custom inputs associated with it, but he did uh, have a paper called The Ultimate Display in 1965 where he mentions having uh, joysticks with haptic feedback which was a little bit unusual for the time. Computers didn't use joysticks as much as games, but I think was pretty forward thinking of him since that's basically what we have today. So this brings us to something else worth mentioning as you see all this hardware that was from the past that clearly didn't go with us all the way through the 80s and 90s to today. I thought when I started researching this talk that there would be a really strong correlation between uh, software demands and hardware. Software would come out that needed new inputs and hardware would be made for it. Um, actually, when it comes to computers specifically, uh, hardware costs seem to be a much, uh, much stronger force. Games demand better input, but software people will kind of deal with. So in general, to make new successful inputs, you have to do two things. You have to have cheap and reliable components across the board, and you also need to have software that takes advantage of it. If you make a cool new pen and only one OS runs it, it's not going to go anywhere either. One of the most famous demos of this kind of research, the, the inputs and so on, was in 1968. The mother of all demos. How many people in this room have heard of the mother of all demos before? OK, like about half. All right, so if you haven't heard of it or you haven't watched the video, there are highlights on YouTube. Um, it's the most famous computer demonstration, really, of all time because it was awesome. And it actually took place about a mile from here in Civic Center in a now abandoned hall underneath Civic Center Plaza. Well, I know. <laughs> Let's go have, have a party there. And also, a fun fact, it was also the first place they ever had a WWDC. So in this demo, Doug Engelbart, that's him on the left there, showed off a lot of the work that his uh, research team had been doing at Stanford Research Institute. It was called the Augmentation Research Center. So this is a screenshot from the very beginning of the demo. And then I'll play a little bit of the video where they were showing off a variety of things. So he was showing off about seven or eight years of work at this point. Uh, it was called the Online System, or NLS. Um, so why was this so important despite the uh, eraser head style lighting? Because it showed off like all of this stuff in an hour and a half. This was in 1968. Windows, hypertext, graphics, video conferencing, word processing, revision control. He goes through all of this in one hour and a half long demo. It blew everyone's minds. Uh, so that's the most famous early demo of the mouse, as well as many other technologies that we uh, sort of take for granted today. Um, and Engelbart usually does get the credit for inventing the mouse around 1963. However, I do have to give a shout out to the German company, the Telefunken RK168. Just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> so. This is kind of what we had for the computer mouse the other day, but then the Telefunken comes out exactly the same time as the NLS demo. And it looks really polished. You can buy this for around $20,000. So it's right up there. We don't know, actually, when they invented their version of the rollerball mouse because they didn't think it was important enough to patent, which is interesting. They actually just thought, and you know, you saw the, the 1946 stuff. It had been around. So they just bothered to turn it over and put that casing on it. So, but regardless of whoever made it first, Engelbart's work was certainly the most influential, especially since he was in Stanford, right at the heart of a lot of computing. So here's, here's the story. So Engelbart comes out with this. Uh, they do their big demo. It's a mouse, big wow. However, you'll notice that on the other side, this is a custom input that has no labels whatsoever that has to be memorized. This is basically the beginning of modern hotkeys. 
Um, it's great if you already understand it, but if you don't know it, they did, really didn't teach it well. So uh, this only works with the online system, and the online system is incredibly hard to use. They try to commercialize it, it just never takes off because it doesn't give you a lot of visual feedback. This is great on the physical feedback side, it does not work on the visual feedback side. Um, so, but many of the people who were working at ARC go on to a lot more famous places. They go to Xerox, they go to Apple, they go to Sun, they go to Microsoft. So this group was in incredibly influential. So they go to Xerox, a lot of them go to Xerox Park and they make the Xerox Alto. This one might look familiar. And this was the first combination mouse plus GUI. So this is the grand idea of them all. They released it later commercially as the Xerox Star. I don't think it costs like $11,000, but hey, it was out there. And uh, Jeff Raskin, who at the time was developing for the GUI for the mic uh, no, sorry, Macintosh, uh, decides to go have a visit and see what Xerox is doing. So you go check it out, and as you can see, really influenced Apple. So on the second visit, that's when Steve Jobs comes. And he pays Xerox in Apple shares to access new features that they were, had been keeping secret, but he walks away just excited about the mouse, which thousands of people had seen at this point, and anyone could go and see for free. Ironic. So he goes back, and he meets the guys who are going to found IDEO, and he, according to D Dean Harvey, one of the co-founders of IDEO, says this, we need a mouse, we love this mouse, but it needs to be cheaper. It needs to be $15, and it needs to not break. The Xerox mouse notoriously broke all the time, and it cost $400. So, a lot about this is not actually true, as I learned from reading about it. It was more like $35, but the fact is to go from $400 for a mouse to $35 for a mouse is a pretty big jump, especially back then. Again, cheap and reliable hardware. That's how it starts to become ubiquitous. So if you've ever wondered why Apple had a one-button mouse, how many of you know this, actually? I'm curious that Apple famously made the decision to have a one-button mouse, and they argued about it for years, and it was terrible. OK, some of you. Well, now you know. <laughs> Why did they make a one-button mouse? Well, if all of your competitors have more moving parts and that makes them more expensive, one of the easiest ways to have cheaper hardware is to have less moving parts. And so that's my pet theory. There are other theories. Jeff Raskin says it was his idea. Um, and actually, some people say that the documentation writers said they only wanted a one-button mouse because they didn't want to have to explain about two buttons, which, OK, possible, I guess. <laughs> Um, but the other big uh, thing I want to point out about this decision to have a one-button mouse was that it meant that they had to have a lot of visual workarounds. They had to invent the click and drag. They had to invent the double click, for example, and the lasso select to get around the fact that they only had one physical affordance now. You take away the physical, you have to add more visual. That's the rules. So 15 years after the mother of all demos first sort of popularized the notion of a mouse, there are finally a good number of consumer mouse mice on the market. You've got the Xerox Star mouse up there. The whole kit for Star actually was $20,000. This is the Apple Lisa mouse. The whole kit combined on its own, it was $11,000. Down here, you have the Microsoft mouse, which was only $200. And then you've got the Logitech mouse, the P4, which was $300. And this, this is what you had for cutting edge inputs at the beginning of the personal computing era. The mouse was great. Um, some, some people might not like the mouse, like M, or right there. <laughs> but in terms of what you could do compared to other types of inner inputs, it was great. You didn't have to fight against gravity. It stayed in the same place, unlike a rollerball. It let you keep one hand on the keyboard. Um, and sometimes it had extra buttons, so you could add, do two things at the same time. And also, this is really important. This all shipped with hardware that took full advantage of what it could do, not just one app and lots of apps. And this really surprisingly cool app that I just found on Saturday, like, how beautiful is this? This shipped with the uh, Microsoft mouse. It's called Doodle EXX, no, EXE. OK, so we're up to 1983, dawn of the personal computing era. But let's talk about video games on the flip side. OK. So the first versions of video games actually did kind of suck and were basically just like cheesy one-offs. Uh, this is called Birdie Brain. This is built by Joseph Katz for the Canadian National Exhibit in 1952. Anybody know who this is? Dan Kay, that's right. Yeah, OK. A uh, personal favorite. Anyway, OK. So there was also OXO, which was you know basically the same game. This is an emulator. It looks something like this. And then there was also a game called Tennis for Two. I don't understand. 
how this is tenants for two. But that was the interface, so anyway, mystery. Um, but everyone knows that the best games are usually the games that end up getting copied over and over. So let's talk about the one game that inspired a ton of other games, Space War. Great name. So Space War was written in 19... Doesn't it look like the other game, though? I'm still confused. Anyway, so Space War was written in 1962 by some folks at MIT, um, and it actually went nuts. Like, universities around America started... It was like the original craze, Space War. Um, here's uh, some people playing it back in the day, and then here's a more modern version that actually was available at the Museum of the Moving Image in... Uh, where is that? Queens? Yeah, up in Queens until recently. And notice the, the joysticks again, much like we saw earlier for computers. Um, anyway, so it was a surprise hit, and by 1972, it inspired two copies, both of which are notable. The first one is called Galaxy Game. Galaxy Game was made by two students at Stanford. They spent $65,000 out of pocket and set them up on the campus. They were wildly popular. It never really took off that much just because they decided not to monetize. You note that it has the two joysticks here. Um, that was Bill Pitts and Hugh Tuck. And it also inspired a second copy, more important, which did go somewhere, and that was called Computer Space. <laughs> <laughs> Computer Space was made by the Atari guys before they founded Atari. And they had custom hardware, it looks super cool. Uh, they put a prototype in a bar in Palo Alto, which still exists, you can go there today. I think it's called like the Grey Goose. Um, and they got enough sales from arcades to, to go into production officially. So you notice that the one back here has joysticks, the other ones don't. This was a prototype that never shipped. Uh, it should have shipped, though, because as it turns out, what they ended up shipping with was an interface that looked like this. And across the board, they found out it was too hard to play. It didn't really, it like, did pretty well, but that was the feedback they got. It was too hard to play like this. So Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, the co-founders of Atari, bounced back. Um, they founded Atari, and their first hit with Atari was a game called Pong, which was actually another copy of another game that came from the Magnavox Odyssey. The Magnavox Odyssey was the first home game console ever. It, came, it looked like this, and it came with a controller that looked like this. Now, you will notice that there is a button <laughs> called the English button. And it took me actually a while to figure out what this is. So all of the games basically involve moving a ball back and forth. Uh, and if you've ever played billiards, English is a term for changing the veloc or, yeah, velocity of the ball. So that's what the English button does. <laughs> All right, so it came with a bunch of like overlays that look like this, one for each game. So even though it didn't have really good graphics, you could at least pretend. Um, and like I said, it launched with at least 12 games. Oh, it also had a light gun. Like, can't get away from the light gun, right? So Magnavox Odyssey also came with a, a gun. So the games look like this, um, and it kind of looks like Pong, and it might be one of any of these games because of the 12 games that Wikipedia described, seven of the games start with a sentence, two players use paddles to knock a ball back and forth on a screen. So it could be table tennis, tennis, hockey, volleyball, handball, soccer, or basketball. I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, so the founder of Atari and the creator of Pong, Nolan Bushnell, plays the Magnavox Odyssey in May 1972. By November 1972, they had come out with Pong. All right, that is clearly them ripping that off. Um, for inputs, just like the Odyssey, it just had like paddles, little knobs that you go back and forth. They're called paddles, they're basically just knobs. Um, it was a huge hit, and so Ralph Bauer of Magnavox sued, and Nolan Bushnell settled. And they had to give all of their profits, not only from Pong, but from all of the Asian copycats of Pong for like the next three years. So that, that happened. So back to the software and hardware. After the legal debacle, uh, Atari goes and makes their own home version of Pong. It comes out in, uh, what, 1973, I think. As you can see, this is just for Pong, right? Like, it would be very difficult to play any game other than Pong on this device. But the next year, when they actually release the... Um, the first Atari set, they have these, these are basically the same knobs as before, but you see that now that they've also included some joysticks. Um, and it also came with one game called Combat. 
So that was the beginning. Uh, there was no clearly cheap or easy way to combine these together, uh, so they settled for the specific inputs for specific games. And this is interesting because we kind of have this today still with game consoles, but no one's ever really shipping right now with, with two different inputs for the same thing. So there were improvements in the controllers over time. Most notably, this is called the Fairchild Channel F, and they had much better joysticks that actually had eight-way directional inputs and uh, also uh, came back to the middle so you didn't have to reset it yourself. And even though this particular console, it only shipped with 25 games, was a flop, uh, they actually ended up making a copy of it for the Atari. And here's some other Atari controllers. Uh, this one is called the Telstar console, and it comes with literally every type of input you could ever possibly have. <laughs> what I would really like us to do is make a game that uses all of these at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to the normal inputs. Um, this is basically what you could get, and all the, although these are Atari specific, this is also pretty evocative of what you could get in any home console at the time. So this one, by the way, was notoriously terrible, and they actually released another rollerball input to kind of make up for it. We'll, talk, we'll see that one in a little bit. So at this time, this is 1983, something very, very important was happening in the home console game in America. It was a great video game crash. All right, so what happened? There were a lot of home consoles on the market, so there was some amount of market saturation. And the games basically look like this. This is Halloween. That's E.T. Then we got Kool-Aid Man, Alligator Man, and Jump Man. All, right. <laughs> All of these look amazingly cool, but none of them looked as cool as the games that you could play at the arcade at the same time. Here's the uh, Star Wars. Atari game that came out and is vector-based. You might have played it in real life today. It's still an amazingly cool game. And its hardware looked like this. It was highly customized. It was heavy. It lasted a long time. And it was designed specifically for the game. It's almost more like a car controls than it is the, the cheap home game console inputs. I, so that's it on the, the type of games you could play. But I was also doing some research about the 1983 crash and what people were thinking. And I, this quote in particular caught my eye. This is someone who was talking about how games were starting to be saturated. And basically, he just said, the games are boring. They get boring really quickly. There isn't a lot of value. There isn't a lot of replay. So, uh, so that's a good data point. Games were boring. People already had the, the computers. And then also, I found this other article. This is a little hard to read. Uh, this is a 16,000-word screed on what the best controllers are that was written in 1983. But apparently, they had a lot of concerns. They were saying, all of these games suck to play with the current controllers. By the way, you'll notice up here, it mentions the Apple Paddle controllers. Apparently, Apple had Paddle controllers back in the 80s. I didn't know that. You probably knew that. Anyway, so the games are boring, and the inputs kind of suck. So no wonder there was a crash at this time, right? They needed new, better content. They needed uh, better inputs. And they needed some groundbreaking uh, evolutions. How many of you work in AR or VR? <laughs> Does this sound familiar right now, by the way? Yes, exactly. OK, so it was bad in America. That was the year of the crash, 1983. But meanwhile, in Japan, some things were happening. In 1982, the Donkey Kong Game & Watch had come out. And this is good, uh, worth mentioning not only because it's Donkey Kong, but also because of this, the D-pad. The D-pad is the most consistent, and I would actually argue now, the most important innovation in game controllers. Nintendo added it to the Famicom when it released it in 1983. And then, of course, we all know the NES came out in 1985, 1986 in America, and there the D-pad is again. Also, a light gun. <laughs> Don't you love that 50 years later, still got the light guns? OK, so if you read about the history of controllers and D-pads, you'll read how important it was. Um, it really was. I think, like the mouse, this was the thing that brought people over from heavy, two-handed style joysticks to being able to move their fingers really quickly. Uh, and here's something else about this controller I want to point out. No other controller that I've shown so far, and no other controller that I was able to find when I was researching this talk, was so light. And you could hold it in your hands so easily. You could have two-handed input. It had really shallow buttons. And you could move your fingers really fast. Not only did Super Nintendo allow you to put input in that quickly, but you could, were able to physically do it. So this is a great example of a controller that nails the physical input. And as we all know, the video, or the video games themselves really nailed the audio component. So for inputs to become popular, they have to be cheap. 
and there has to be software that takes advantage of it, and the NES is a great example of this. Um, the games were reasonably priced, so was a console, and obviously they had like Tetris, Nintendo, sorry, Tetris, Zelda, Super Mario, like we all know and love these games. Um, but the D-pad to my mind was really the kicker, and it's actually been a part of every game controller, basically every game controller ever since, with some rare exceptions. Certainly all the ones that ship with major consoles. Ironically, of all of these, only Nintendo has ever tried to split the hands apart again, like for real, which is interesting. So let's pause again for a minute around 1983. This is, uh, this is basically what we had for hardware on both sides. So we've got the Favicon, or Famicon. Um, this is the, the rollerball that I mentioned that Atari put out because their joystick was so bad. And we already talked about all the mice. Um, unfortunately, touchpads and styluses did exist at this time, but they were way too expensive. They didn't really take off. And this is, I think, arguably, what we have had for input, the closest we've had for input ever since. Like, we have touchpads now, we have trackpads, we have styluses, but this has kind of set the tone for how computing would be for the next 20 to 30 years. 1983, okay. that was the year. <laughs> okay, so that's a very, very brief history of a lot of inputs up to 1983. Um, I skipped over a bunch, there are a lot more to talk about. Um, but I wanna stop here because not only is it a seminal time, but I think it matches up really nicely to where we are with spatial computing. Actually, we might be more like 1979. One thing we can clearly see about computers today versus game consoles is that they have effectively decided to go one of two ways. So you do not use your game controllers to check your email, and you don't play Witcher 3 on your phone, unless you do and you have a really souped up phone. But in essence, this to me comes down to that balances between affordances and feedback, more, more physical or more visual. And this is extremely important right now because we're at a really interesting inflection point with spatial computing specifically. So there are basically two schools of thought, I would say, around designing for input and UI right now. The first is the Apple version, I would say, or at least it's encapsulated by this. Users rely on recognition, not recall. They shouldn't have to remember anything that the computer already knows. And I think if you talk to a lot of people today, they would agree with this. They would say that this is the way good design is, this is how you make things that are intuitive. You should not, you should offload all of the hard work onto the user. And, there, and, and some, sometimes this is correct, but. Did anybody recognize that sound? Mario Kart? Yeah, raise your hand actually if you wanted to hit the A button like right after that <laughs> came out. Exactly. Okay. So there's another school of thought around teaching interactions and getting physical feedback. And, and I made up this quote myself because I couldn't find a good one, but you teach the users which buttons map to which actions until it's second nature, and then they move it all over into muscle memory. And so again, they're not really recalling anything, they're just reacting, but you've taught it to them. Um, these also have some differences in terms of, of mastery overall. Okay. So, a device like this is easy to learn, but it is literally impossible to master. You will never be able to type on your phone without making typos, without looking at it, right? There's no way to be that good physically at it, even if you want to be. On the flip side, we have game controllers that are hard to learn, but can be mastered. You can get really good at it. You can learn it enough that you don't need to look at your hands anymore. The thing about phones is no one cares if you're good at your phone. There's no leaderboard, there's no scores, there's no nothing. You can just mess up and we have autocorrect, we're moving more into voice commands. We do all of these things so that you can just see visually what you wanna see. So it's a lot more heavy on the visuals, low on the physical. On the flip side, if you mess up on a game, that's the whole point, right? So you can't mess up. You need to be able to quickly and efficiently do things in a game. It's less important on the phone. So now let's talk about Oh, and by the way, when I say mastered, I specifically mean getting to the point where it's in muscle memory and you don't need to think about it. You can just kind of react. So let's talk about AR and VR. This is where we are with high-end controllers today. They are basically game controllers that have been split into two. They're not particularly innovative, although there's a lot of tracking functionality that is pretty cool. But they are really familiar. If you've played with game controllers before, you know about these. Um, like early game controllers, I think you know we're in that stage where we're using hardware and software that's just very familiar, and that's totally okay. It took years and years for the D-pad to be invented for the game controller. I think it will take a long time for us to really nail what we need for spatial computing out of our inputs. 
So game controllers let you learn via muscle memory. Uh, you want to pick them up quickly and accurately. You want to be able to throw things, which is like the number one thing anyone does in VR. And you want to be able to just map that to a muscle memory thing. So m this makes sense. I would argue that mobile VR is a lot worse off because the product people on this side are coming from the mobile sphere, which is heavily front-loading on the visuals. So they naturally chose a direction that is very low on the physical side and very high on the visual side. So in that sense, they're trying to mimic the choices that we made for phones. The downside is here is that mobile VR is not as good as a phone. There's not enough reason to put up with bad and unreliable inputs. So secondly, and more importantly, when you are in VR, you are in a world. You're in a world where you want to do a lot of things and you want to be able to do it instinctively. When it comes to working with digital objects that look and feel real, people already have a lot of ideas about how we think we should be interacting with them. In many senses, we have already mastered the real world. We just need to learn how to use it with new inputs. When we make inputs that only have one button that are designed for spatial computing, we have decided that people will never be able to really immerse themselves. They will have to have visual feedback. And therefore, they will never be able to truly master the digital world. These are important choices that we are making with the inputs today. So let's talk a little bit about AR as well. This is covering the VR side as it is today. The most famous examples are from movies. We all know about mobile AR. It's kind of constrained to the medium right now, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, but this is an example. This one is from Prometheus. Now, movies are a weird way to, to see the future, because movies, by definition, as the medium, are front-loading on the visuals and the sound. That's all they can do. Like, a movie cannot reach out and touch you, and you can't hit a bunch of buttons with it. That's the whole point. So when, you, when it comes to seeing things like this, in movies, you usually see just like HECA visuals that look absolutely stunning, really good visuals, and really wide-ranging gestures that are designed to kind of take the place of what you would have if you ha actually were physically manipulating this stuff. This scene is from Prometheus. This is the Ori scene. How many of you have seen this movie before? All right, the movie's not good, but watch this scene. This is the good scene. <laughs> So this looks beautiful, and it seems really intuitive, the way he's interacting with the world right now. But keep in mind, there is no physical feedback here whatsoever. There is no tight, there's really no way to have these feel good and not have to involve a lot of audio and visuals without physical feedback and still be well designed. So what you see here, it looks beautiful. It has great sound. But this is not practical for everyday life when all you want to do is check your email or in this case, alien Google Maps. There he goes. All right. All right, I'm going to pause there for a second, because I want to say this. Movie UIs are really nice inspiration, but when it comes to real inputs and real interactivity, we need to provide both obvious, simple, heavy on the audio, heavy on the visual solutions for people to learn, but we also need really robust inputs so that people can master. So the mouse opened up computing to a whole new world of people that probably would have never have used it if it had stayed keyboard only. The Nintendo controller allowed for people to really take gaming to the next level. The stylus means now that you can write or draw on a screen just like it's natural. This is great. Inputs are very powerful. So remember, nope. Inputs are how humans interact with the digital world. So if you limit inputs, you limit what humans can do. If you design the inputs well, more humans will be able to do more things in digital worlds. All right, thanks very much. All right, everybody go. No, that's good. I don't know if we can do questions or not. Is there a thing that's happening? Do we have time? Does anyone have a question? Yeah, OK. So there was supposed to be a pattern of copying. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there were some earlier incarnations that kind of look vaguely D-pad-ish, usually circular with some sort of arrow thing, but the actual D-pad itself was invented by a designer at Nintendo. He was, a, he was looking at someone playing with their mobile calculator, he said. Although I will say, researching this talk, I found out that nothing is actually true at all, so. <laughs> Anything else? Sure, so in terms of the software side. Yeah, talk loud. 
Sure. So um, I'm making a VR joystick. It's supposed to be like a sixth off uh, rotate, also translation. Um, the big thing I'm hitting is I want to have more physical feedback. Yes. Um, but all I have is a little haptic buzzer. I'm not on the hardware side. I'm on right. the software side. Um, what are some things you can do to try to up that um, physical feedback? Audio. Not just visuals. It's yeah. all you got. All audio. I mean, you could probably do some cool stuff with visual, like coming towards your face that would approximate. And side by side with audio, you can get to the point where people feel like they're being slapped around. But without uh, making them sick. But audio would be better, probably. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I wish you had more, but that's about it. Well, I don't know. You could have like sticky buttons or really analog controllers. You could play around with the mechanical stuff, too. All right. No? One more? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, so speaking of uh, mobile VR inputs, um, how much of those decisions do you think is just ruthless prioritizing because of the limitations of technology versus actual design decisions of let's make it this limited? Um, because it, you also mentioned that it needs to be cheap and reliable to be ubiquitous, so it seems like they were yeah, that's going true. towards that point. Um, if, if folks in here, how, how much of the design decisions around simplifying the mobile UI uh, or mobile VR inputs is, is uh, practical, I would say. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, actually what I know is, is kind of anecdotal just based on what people have told me. Actually, Chet right there might have some good insights into the Valve 5 controllers. Not really? Yes? We're trying to be simple, but more complex. We had to actually use, what was the magnetic controller? Um, the magnetic they controller. They never shipped. They were a, a demo. Denny from Cloudhead was showing. Oh, the Six Sense ones. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. And they had a bunch of buttons on it. And they I just do. kept accidentally hitting all the buttons wrong. And um, it became very hard. And so we wanted to simplify it because one of the cool things with VR is people went in VR and they instantly wanted to interact in a natural way. Yes. And not add a bunch of. Oh right. my God, what button do I hit the A or B button, right? You wanted to be able to have a single point of input so that people knew they could just get, automatically do it. And much of it is, is affordance of just people instantly said, well, I've got one thing under my finger. Mm -hmm. I'm going to squeeze that to try to grab this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was the thing they had. Um, that reminds me, I had a, a conversation with uh, the Daydream folks and the Alchemy guys were there. They made Job Simulator, uh, which is, literally has one thing you can do. It has one verb. You can pick up things and put them places or put them down. But it really only needs one button. So I was going off on a tirade about how we needed more buttons. Uh, and they were like, no, you only need one. Everyone gets confused. So my answer to that is if you really only have one verb, just map every single button to that one verb. And there you go. <laughs> They'll never hit one button. But obviously, not all games are that simple. Some games have a lot more. And when they did that, they also had very prototypey hardware, and the pad broke all the time. That's true. So people just kept with the one that didn't break. Oh, interesting. This so is why, this that's is, this, this is why if you're making again. hardware, when something breaks, replace it really quickly. And we mm. tried to do that just so that developers didn't start using that as a crutch or start avoiding things because it didn't work right. That is really interesting. That actually came up with the capacitive touch stuff for the touch controllers where, yeah, people just they couldn't get it. But if it had been more, more um, easy to find, we probably would have used it more. Yeah. M. The Daydreams controller might have one button, but they only sell it with one controller, which oh, I, I think is interesting, which, like, those controllers must cost $5. Like, and if someone's going to pay $80 for a headset, like, you can pay $85 for the same headset with two controllers, which yeah. would make the headset much more usable. Yeah. So I do think that they're making a design decision versus a financial decision based, just based on the number of controllers that they sell with the headset. Yeah, I do think there's a lot of bad data right now um, that's anecdotal around um, people trying out VR because they'll try it on a showroom floor or at a convention for five minutes, and the feedback is people didn't get it, make it more simple. And again, that's great. You need that at first. You need the visual, you need the audio, you need it to be simple, but then the, it, it hamstrings people later on when they're trying to actually master the medium. Anything from the Google side you want to say? <laughs> We're just taking it to No. All right. OK, so I think there's a, another talk coming up fairly soon, so we should probably head out. Thanks all. I really appreciate it.